So now that we discussed the details of gluconeogenesis, as always, let's actually summarize our results into a single lecture. And let's begin by defining what gluconeogenesis actually is. Well, gluconeogenesis is the process by which the cells of our body can actually generate ATP molecules beginning with non-carbohydrate precursor molecules such as pyruvate as well as things like lactate molecules and amino acids and glycerol molecules. Now, what types of cells generally carry out the process of gluconeogenesis? Well, the cells of our body that actually are responsible for regulating and maintaining the glucose levels inside our blood. So cells such as liver cells and to a smaller extent kidney cells generally carry out gluconeogenesis. Now, that's not to say that other cells don't actually use gluconeogenesis. In fact, under certain conditions, cells such as skeletal muscle cells and cardiac muscle cells and brain cells can also use gluconeogenesis. So this process is not only exclusive to liver cells and kidney cells, other cells actually use the process. But there is an important difference and we'll discuss that at the end of the lecture. So let's begin by focusing on step number one. And step number one of gluconeogenesis takes place within the matrix of the mitochondrion. Why within the matrix? We, well, because the enzyme that catalyzes step one actually is found within the matrix of the mitochondrion. So let's suppose this is our cytoplasm and this is our mitochondrion. So we have the outer membrane of the mitochondrion and the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. And this is the space between the two membranes. So that means this is the matrix. So we have a pyruvate molecule is transformed into an oxaloacetate intermediate and it's catalyzed by pyruvate carboxylase. Now what this enzyme does is it basically hydrolyzes an ATP molecule and that energy that is released in that hydrolysis is used to drive the carboxylation of the pyruvate into an oxaloacetate. What that means is we break down an ATP to attach a carbon dioxide onto that pyruvate to form that oxaloacetate. And because we take two pyruvates and transform them into two oxaloacetates, we use two ATP molecules and two CO2 molecules in step one. Now, once we form that oxaloacetate, that molecule can now move on to step two. Now, the problem with that is step two takes place in the cytoplasm because the enzyme that catalyzes step two is found in the cytoplasm. And so what that means is before oxaloacetate can be used by step two as the reactant in step two, it must be moved into the cytoplasm. Now, the oxaloacetate itself cannot be moved across the two membranes of the mitochondrion. Before it can be moved, it has, it has to be reduced. And so we actually reduce the oxaloacetate into a malate by the activity of malate dehydrogenase and it uses an NADH molecule. Now, because we have two, we actually use two of these NADH molecules to, you, to form these two malate. And the malate then moves across special membrane proteins found on the two membranes of the mitochondria and into the cytoplasm. And once inside the cytoplasm, we essentially use that same malate dehydrogenase, but now we use the NAD plus to basically oxidize the malate back into the oxaloacetate. So we essentially use two NADHs to form the two NAD pluses, and then we use two NAD pluses to actually form the two NADHs. And we form our two oxaloacetates in the cytoplasm, the same ones that we essentially had in that matrix of the mitochondria. Now, let's move on to step number two. In step number two, we have an enzyme known as phosphoenolpyruvate carboxykinase. And what this enzyme actually does is it phosphorylates the oxaloacetate, but at the same time, it also decarboxylates that oxaloacetate to form the phosphoenolpyruvate. Now, why do we need these two different reactions in one step? Well, because to phosphorylate that molecule, that requires energy. And when we decarboxylate something, when we essentially remove a carbon dioxide group, that releases energy. And so 
We couple these two reactions. We use the decarboxylation reaction to basically drive that phosphorylation and we produce the two phosphoenyl pyruvates from these two oxaloacetates. And actually, in this step, we used ATP molecules and in this step, we use GTP molecules. So a single GTP is used per one oxaloacetate that is used to produce the phosphoenyl pyruvate. Now, step one and step two, we basically transform the pyruvate into the phosphoenyl pyruvate. Now, we know that in step 10 of glycolysis, we actually form that pyruvate from the phosphoenyl pyruvate. So the question might be, why can't we just use the reverse process of forming that phosphoenyl pyruvate from the pyruvate that we had in glycolysis? Because that process, the reverse of, ten, of uh, the reverse process of step 10 in glycolysis would actually be a very endergonic process. And so we see to bypass that endergonic process, we create a completely different type of reaction pathway that actually creates a process that is favorable. And so we basically drive the unfavorable process by using these favorable processes such as the hydrolysis of ATP in this particular case and the decarboxylation in this particular case. Now, once we carry out step number two, then we form the phosphoenyl pyruvate. And then we have step three, four, five, six, and seven. And all these steps, so three to seven, are essentially the same exact steps that we saw in glycolysis, except they're in reverse. So why is it that we can use these steps and not the steps that I just mentioned before? Well, because these steps actually have a Gibbs free energy value that is very close to zero. And so what that means is these are at equilibrium. And so if we are at the right conditions, if the conditions inside the cell actually favor the formation of glucose, actually favor the process of gluconeogenesis, these reactions will simply take place spontaneously. And so that's why gluconeogenesis simply utilizes the same step as glycolysis except they're in reverse because these steps are at equilibrium. So in step number three we use enolase and by the way notice we also use these same enzymes that we had in glycolysis. So phosphoenol pyruvate is transformed into 2-phosphoglycerate by the action of enolase. Then phosphoglycerate mutase transfers the phosphoryl group from carbon 2 to carbon 3 to produce the three phosphoglycerate molecules. Then in the next step, step 5, the phosphoglycerate kinase creates the 1,3-BPG, so bisphosphoglycerate. And then that is transformed via the action of gap dehydrogenase into the two glyceraldehydes. And one of those glyceraldehydes is transformed into the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, so DHAP, by the action of triose phosphate isomerase. And now that we form these two molecules, aldolase can actually combine these two molecules in step seven to form the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And again, all these steps take place within the cytoplasm of that particular cell. Now, once we get to step eight, this is when the pathway becomes different than the pathway that we use in glycolysis. Why? Well, because in glycolysis, when we go from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, that process is very exergonic. And that means if we simply use the reverse process of glycolysis, that would mean this reaction, the reverse one, would be a very endergonic reaction. And so so for that same reason that we basically had to use a completely different reaction mechanism to transform the pyruvate into the phosphoenyl pyruvate, in step 8 we also use a different reaction mechanism, different than in glycolysis, to transform the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into the fructose 6-phosphate. And that also means we use a different enzyme. And so we use fructose 1,6-bisphosphate phosphatase. Phosphatase means we essentially remove a phosphoryl group.
And so what happens in this step is we actually use a water molecule to hydrolyze the ester bond that is holding the carbon number one and that phosphoryl group. And so this process actually releases energy. It's an exergonic process. And so we're able to form the fructose 6-phosphate spontaneously under physiological cell conditions. Now, once we form that fructose 6-phosphate, Step number nine is simply the reverse of step number two in glycolysis. Why? Well, once again, the same reason as in this particular case, because this step is reversible and the Gibbs free energy is very close to zero. So this reaction is at equilibrium and this will spontaneously take place and will form that glucose 6-phosphate. Now, this is where the difference between the different types of cells actually comes into play. So let's suppose we're in liver cells or a kidney cell. And because the job of these cells is to regulate the glucose levels inside our blood, their job is to actually form these glucose and release the glucose into the blood when, for instance, our levels of glucose in the blood drops. Uh, drops. And so what the next step would be in a liver cell or a kidney cell is that glucose 6-phosphate is moved into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So we have the ER membrane shown here and the lumen of the ER. And in liver cells or kidney cells, the glucose 6-phosphate basically moves into the lumen of the ER via a special type of membrane protein called T1, so glucose 6-phosphate transporter. And once that glucose 6-phosphate is inside the lumen, we basically have the hydrolysis of this ester bind by the activity of glucose 6-phosphatase. And a protein known as calcium binding, stabilizing protein shown in pink, basically assists the, gluco assists the glucose 6-phosphate in this hydrolysis process. So the water basically is found in a lumen of the ER. We hydrolyze that to form and uh, an inorganic phosphate group, so the orthophosphate as well as the glucose. Now, we have a special protein in the membrane of the ER known as T2, so phosphate transporter, that basically moves that inorganic phosphate into the cytoplasm. And we also have a special glucose transporter called T3 that shuttles this glucose into the cytoplasm. So, we actually see that Five different proteins, one, two, three, four, five, are involved in transforming that glucose 6-phosphate into the glucose in liver cells and kidney cells. And so now that we form the glucose, and let's suppose we have a low level of glucose in the blood, that glucose can easily leave that cell via special type of membrane glucose transporter. Now, what's the difference between glucose 6-phosphate and glucose? Well, glucose 6-phosphate, because of that phosphate group, it cannot actually leave the cell. And so the reason this process takes place in liver cells is so that we can remove that molecule, remove that phosphoryl group that traps the glucose inside the cell. Now, what about in cells like muscle cells? So let's suppose a muscle cell is under starvation conditions and it has to use gluconeogenesis to actually form these molecules, the glucose molecules. In cells like muscle cells that are not responsible for maintaining the glucose levels in our blood, this process will stop in this stage. Once that muscle cell generates the glucose 6-phosphate, it doesn't want to remove that phos uh, phosphoryl group because it doesn't want to lose that glucose to the outside. Because once we form glucose, that glucose is no longer trapped inside the cell. And so in cells like muscle cells, so skeleton muscle cells or cardiac muscle cells, once we form the glucose 6-phosphate, this process stops. And now the glucose 6-phosphate can, for instance, form glycogen or it can be used to form ATP molecules. So, and by the way, pyruvate molecules are not the only types of non-carbohydrate precursor molecules that we can use to form these glucose. We can actually use amino acids, glycerol, and lactate. Now, 
lactate and certain amino acids such as alanine can actually be transformed into pyruvate and so these enter the gluconeogenic pathway gluconeogenesis via pyruvate other amino acids can be transformed into oxaloacetate and glycerol molecules are transformed into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and they enter this process via this stage here so if we actually sum up all these individual steps we described, this is the net reaction that we're going to get. So in gluconeogenesis, two pyruvate molecules, four ATP molecules, two GTP molecules, two NADH molecules, and six water molecules are used to produce a single glucose, four ADPs, two GDPs, six uh, orthophosphates, two NAD pluses, and two H pluses. And this reaction under normal physiologic conditions is an exergonic reaction. It releases a certain amount of energy. So basically, to summarize, we in, in this process, we essentially use the hydrolysis of these high energy molecules to drive all these other unfavorable processes so that at the end, this reaction takes place spontaneously, quickly, and effectively inside the cells of our body.